The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's webinar, The Future Is Now. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a minute to go over a couple ground rules for today's webinar. All phones have been placed on mute for the duration of this webinar. Should you have any questions during the webinar, please submit your questions in the questions tab and we'll try to answer them as time permits or try to follow up with you following the webinar. This webinar is also offering CPE credit. If you are attending and would like, the, like to get your CPE credits, you will need to complete the three polling questions that are asked throughout the webinar. All three of those must be completed in order to be eligible for CPE credit. You will also need to complete the evaluation that will be emailed out following the webinar. At this point, I would now like to hand it over to Jeff Ziplo to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Jared. Um, first off, I want to welcome everyone to the Future Is Now webinar. Um, I hope everyone joining us today is healthy and well during these crazy times. Um, so really, when you think about it, over the past couple of months due to COVID, we've seen a number of transformative changes in, uh, in our operations. Um, this includes the new teleworker. You know, being able to perform work at home in an efficient, effective, and hopefully secure way. We certainly have a, a much better understanding of the term what social distancing is and what it means and how we need to, um, how it can be impactful for us. Um, I, I certainly know myself, we wash our hands whenever we touch something outside of our house. So based on these facts, you know, let's, let's think a little bit differently and, and look at the future and understand what the impact is um, to municipalities. So once mun municipalities are open, we need to rethink how we can perform various tasks and activities within the municipality safely, effectively, and securely. In reality, this means we really need to consider how we can operate the municipality somewhat virtually, but maintain the overall operations, the financial controls and services provided to your respective residents. So the Future Now webinar will provide a, a brief economic update and also fo focus on best practices and, no, and new protocols for municipalities to consider implementing. We've highlighted a number of topics that we think are very important that we'll be reviewing today, including you know, the economic update, um, new budgeting processes, virtual processes, um, the future of touchless payments, uh, and purchase cards. What I'd like to do now is just introduce the uh, webinar speakers very quickly. We've got a great panel for you this morning. Um, they're here to provide their insight, their knowledge and experience with a multitude of really important topics. Um, first person uh, is Steve Andrews from Webster Bank. He'll be providing us with an uh, update and an overview uh, on the economic conditions. One of my partners, Ron Nozek from Bloom Shapiro will provide um, some considerations for a new budgeting process. Myself, Jeff Ziplo, um, also from Bloom, will provide insight into um, virtual municipal, municipal processes. Sorry about that. Um, and A.G. Morgan will provide information on the future of touchless payments and collections. And lastly, Lori Aguila will discuss purchase cards. So without um, further um, moving this forward, let's turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Jeff and Jared, and, and good morning, everyone, and, and thank you. Uh, Webster is obviously very grateful for our partnership we have with Bloom Shapiro and our other partners on here. Um, very interesting. On the first slide, uh, you know, Yogi Berra, we didn't know he was, he, you know, majored in economics, but, uh, you know, he, he couldn't have got it better because um, on slide three, um, when we started the year, we had gone out and talked to clients around the our footprint kind of setting the table for 2020 and and back then you know we were, we were really looking under rocks to look for risks 
you know, we, we've gone through the impeachment process and, and uh, the China tariff issues and so forth. But we started 2020 in the best shape we've been in in, in, a, in over a decade. Uh, very strong. We had uh, unemployment near 50 year lows. Uh, jobs and wages were rising. Manufacturing and service sectors were running strong and new order pipeline was strong. Even the housing market had started to catch up after being kind of the, the caboose of this recovery, if you will, uh, over the over the beginning. And we're really scratching our head about, you know, what could possibly go wrong. And on the next slide, you know, we uh, the virus hit and uh, Here's a track record looking back over the last 70 years of, of the monthly job numbers and that yellow line across the top, you know, shows monthly gains or drops of a couple hundred thousand and so forth. And then we get to uh, April and, uh, you know, we lost 22 million jobs. It just fell off a cliff there. And down the bottom, you can see the unemployment rate, which was sitting at a 50 year low, uh, shot up over 16 percent. And then the shock wave started to hit. Um, Obviously, the travel industry, restaurants and bars and so forth were, were hit really hard. Um, you know, mortgages, people applying for forbearance and so forth. I think 8% of all, all mortgages right now are in some sort of forbearance, which uh, encompasses about uh, 4.1 million homeowners. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been a tough slog and, and we've seen it spill out to all the different industries. Um, there were probably... Uh, at the start of the recession, there were over 32 million small businesses around the country, and millions of those have been shuttered because of the uh, the shutdown. Um, so, in the next slide, you know, despite all the bad news, and you know, we don't have to go through each one. Um, I think this slide is pretty important because we look at the financial conditions out there. Obviously, what's going on with the credit markets, and there's no surprise there. You can see that on the right hand side the sharp drop as people got concerned of uh, credit conditions, whether it was junk bonds because of what happened with the oil market, obviously municipalities with, with the possible cutbacks in, in tax revenues and so forth. And we saw commercial paper uh, rates spike up and so forth. And, and, but, but then, you know, the Fed stepped in and, and provided their backstop programs and, and some of the programs for uh, paycheck protection and, and the like. And the market started to come back and we started to see credit spreads uh, narrow. And as you can see here, pretty much a V-shaped recovery. We're not quite back to normal yet, but uh, you can see we didn't go, get quite as bad as we did in the middle part of the screen where that, that gray area is, is the last recession in 08 and 09. Um, and it snapped back pretty quickly. So it's, it's a good sign for us, uh, first of all, that there's no systemic risk. I mean, the Fed has done everything they can uh, to make sure that whether it's mortgage-backed securities, uh, municipal bonds, uh, corporate bonds, and, and, and in some cases stocks, uh, have the wherewithal to, uh, to, to function normally, and, and that's a good sign for us. On the next slide, uh, there are a number of green shoots out there we're starting to see, and this looks at, at gasoline demand um, and whether you substitute restaurants, uh, airlines, and so forth. They all seem to be forming a bit of a bottom here. Uh, oil, uh, gasoline demand is up about 32% over the last month, meaning people are starting to get back out in their cars. Hotels, which suffered a 90% drop in occupancies, are up about 70% over the last month. TSA, uh, which screens people at the airports, normally did 2.3, 2.4 million people a day. Uh, and that dropped down to just 95,000 a month ago. And we've, we've, we've more than tripled that now. Last week, I think it was up close to 300,000 a day, which isn't great, but again, showing some signs coming back. And then lastly, Apple keeps track of um, the number of people that go online to look for directions, you know, how do I, whether it's Waze or whatever. And, and that has jumped about 50% since Easter. So people are starting to come out of their cocoons and move around again, which is a good sign. The next slide. Uh, we'd like to look at what's going on with uh, uh, copper and gold because they tend to move in opposite directions when we get in a crisis. Gold prices spike because people want to buy something that'll, that'll hold value if the world ends. And at the same time, copper prices go down as demand for primary metals uh, on the global front as production slows down, that, that falls. But as you can see over on the far right-hand side, the, the ratio is kind of flattened a little bit, and we seem to be forming a bottom there as well. Gold is still over $1,700 an ounce, and will feel, be feel better when that starts to slide back a bit at the same time copper prices rise. But 
again, another green shoot here. The next slide, which is more germane, uh, you know, to what, some of the things we're talking about this morning, from an investment standpoint, which is uh, near and dear to a lot of us here, uh, you know, rates have come down quite a bit. I mean, you, this is a graph of the 10-year Treasury, and you can see several times back in 2010, 2015, we got down to about 1.5%, but kind of held that even last year. But the pandemic caused us to break through and set a, a new low just above 50 basis points about a month ago. And this morning, we're trading in the low 70s. So uh, coming back a little bit. But, you know, as we look at the Fed going forward, it looks for now they're, gonna, they're not going to do anything in terms of tightening rates. Uh, they're going to be very supportive of the markets through next year at the least. We could go into 2022, which means that, you know, short-term investing and so forth is going to be uh, a little bit difficult. If you're issuing bonds or going to the markets, it's a, it's a good time to be doing that. Um, and if we look at the forward curve for futures, which goes out about 10 years, it has short-term rates staying right now below 1% through two, 2026. Now, the forward curve can change quickly if, if things change, if we start to see an economic rebound uh, or inflation starts to ramp up, but uh, it does show a tough investment picture in the short term. At the same time, tax revenues are obviously going to be suffering a bit with shortfalls, both on the state and local standpoint which uh, could force some, some, some municipalities to have some cuts in services and jobs. Um, and in and, and this recovery, unlike 2008, 2009, the private sector could rebound a little bit quicker than the public sector does. Um, now, obviously, the HEROES Act is in front of Congress right now, which provides another trillion dollars in state and local government aid. And with the Fed acting as a backstop for municipalities, that'll offer us some cushion. But... Um, uh, you know, it's going to require some patience and a bit, little bit of tightrope walking for municipalities, at least in the short term here. But as the graphs above showed on the next slide, you know, both stocks and um, uh, the credit markets are, are being relatively optimistic. And we, we kind of see, you know, over the last five or six years, the red line at the bottom is the market's blood pressure, if you will, or the volatility index. And when that tends to spike, we see stocks go down. But after the tremendous crash in stocks of, of, of six weeks ago, um, we've recovered quite a bit here. At the same time, the market's blood pressure had started to go down because they're looking ahead and they seem to think that the second half of this year in 2021 will, will be better. What we're looking at right now is a great experiment in federalism uh, where the federal government is kind of delegating more responsibility to the states in terms of how they want to open up and get out of this, uh, uh, this shutdown, if you will. Um, it obviously backstop by the federal government, but allow the states to make uh, uh, to move forward ahead of perhaps some other ones. And obviously, this recession has been a, a serious blow to to small businesses. But keep in mind, this is the same group of entrepreneurs that, that deal with one crisis or after another on a daily basis. And and like a patient who's ever suffered a serious inju injury, we all know that the will to recover goes a long way towards recuperation. And we're seeing some of that. Uh, as companies chomp at the bit to get going again. So when you add in the right medicines, the aid packages from, from Congress and the backstop from the Fed, this isn't going to be like 2008 and 2009. And we think that we've laid the groundwork for a pretty quick recovery. We're looking for GDP in the third quarter to bounce back after a horrific second quarter of about 8.5% and maybe another 7% in the fourth quarter. Um, and this will be happening by the time we get the report on on uh, on this current quarter, which won't come out till the end of July. But we think we'll be well on the way to recovery by then. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Jeff. All right, we're going to do our first poll question here. So for those who are uh, attending for CPE credit, again, the, these polling questions uh, are required. So we'll we'll leave this polling question uh, up for about uh, a minute or so here. Uh, as we see uh, people get their uh, their selections in. All right, going to keep it open for just about another uh, 10 seconds here. So thank you uh, for all those who are participating. Perfect. Thank you, everybody.
now going to hand it off to uh, Ron Nasik uh, to, to take us through the new budgeting processes. Okay, uh, thanks, Jared. And um, I'm responsible for the the title of this section, and it's it's really not new. It's uh, it, it's conceptual uh, a concept that's been kind of floating around for for some time. But in my experience, um, in in the industry. Uh, rarely used, or, or I, I think if it is used, it's it's perhaps not used to its full extent. So, what I want to talk about today are two topics really uh, that I think are very complementary to one another, and perhaps uh, an ever increasing necessity in local government. They are the annual budget process, uh, and in the case of today's conversation, rethinking that process a little bit. And then I also want to touch on cash flow modeling as well. We'll touch brief, briefly on what I feel is the typical annual budget process, uh, and then take a little more time to talk about an alternative, which would be long-term budget forecasting process. Many of you may be already developing budget plans that contain multiple years, so if you are, my comments may simply be supportive of your process and perhaps provide some alternative considerations to it. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm going to touch on the process of cash flow modeling, which I think can be a far better monitoring tool relative to the budget during the fiscal year. So uh, the next slide, um, just touching briefly on the annual budget process as it stands and, and what it is, in my opinion, <clears throat> I believe, first and foremost, it's the most important policy and decision-making deci uh, decision process performed annually. Uh, however, because it's developed on a, on a one-year perspective, it tends to emphasize short-term tactics over long-term strategies. Typically, the process does not include the consideration of alternative outcomes and thus lacks the ability to be quickly modified if a crisis develops, and clearly we're in one now. Uh, it tends to be static, not flexible in nature, and uh, when events do occur that negatively impact the annual budget, there's there's a typical course of action that is that is normally taken, be they spending freezes, elimination of hiring plans, deferment of new initiatives, and or appropriation of fund balance reserves. That those 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 actions are not meant to be all inclusive, but uh, again, from my perspective, what I have historically seen, that is the course of action that 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 most communities take or most governments take when facing a crisis or an economic crisis. The most unfortunate target on that list that I provided, in my opinion, is the deferment of new initiatives. That deferment most often leads to the complete elimination of the of the initiative in future years, which which I do think is unfortunate. So, you know, that's really the process as it stands. I think uh, as of today, relative to a you know moving on a one year basis from year to year. If we go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, we'll talk a little bit about long term budget forecasting. And you know, what I'm suggesting is that local governments should consider as an alternative the process of long-term budget forecasting in place of the annual one-year scoped budget. One thing I want to be clear on is that long-term budget forecasting is not simply status quo data projected over time. What I mean is that what I mean by it is is that it's not last year's budget plus two percent over three years or five years. This, the process, if followed appropriately, can add a variable element to the budget. The current year plan can be developed with what-if scenarios, thus allowing for a pre-established course of, course of correction if negative events occur. If properly documented and vetted, any actions that will need to be taken will have already been deemed accessible or, I'm sorry, acceptable to the majority and communicated to the public. Meaning, it, it, you through the budget process, uh, the budget making authority will have had the chance to deliberate actions that um, could address uh, possible scenarios that may present themselves, and um, you know ha have fully vetted that process through. Uh, process it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Uh, think of it simply as developing a variable budget plan based on best case 
likely case and worst case scenarios. And um, I, I would hope and think that that most are working relative to the likely case scenario and and not best case scenario on on a regular basis, regardless of of what we're we're facing these days. Um, the long term aspects of this should allow for the integration of policy goals and initiatives. As I indicated earlier, in my mind, this is a significant reason why governments in, often get stuck. And again, th th this is my opinion, not the opinion of Bloomsboro or, or anyone else. But um, city managers, mayors, first selectmen, school superintendents, they often have uh, terrific plans for the future that are valid and could be transform transformative to the communities, but they never get off the ground because they never get integrated into the budget plan and therefore status quo simply remains. So uh, in short, that, that's really the, the concept of long-term budget forecasting, um, looking out into the future, the impacts of initiatives on the future, and then being able to be a little more nimble relative to facing crisis on, uh, on an annual basis or on, on any kind of interim basis. <clears throat> the next slide, just to summarize, I think that the, in, again, in my opinion, the advantages of long-term budget forecasting compared to the annual budget process is that it can help develop stronger fiscal discipline in normal times and in times of crisis. When coupled with cash flow modeling, which we're going to talk about in a second, it can assist in the early identification of budget problems and, more importantly, create a process where the mitigation plan to those problems has been previously developed and vetted. Finally, it can, it can promote sustainability by identifying the long-term impact of policy decisions and initiatives if those are undertaken. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I can't help but think and often think is if, if 30 years ago, uh, governments took on a, a long-term forecasting process relative to pension and OPEB, uh, would we be where we are today? Would it look like it does in 2020? Would governments be in the situation they currently find themselves relative to these liabilities? Certainly, I don't have a uh, an answer to that or a crystal ball to it, but um, it, it it would be interesting to to relive it, uh, having those facts out in advance. So finally, um, we'll touch on cash flow modeling here, and I I do think that the two of these really do integrate with one another, and the cash flow modeling can become uh, probably the most valuable tool relative to monitoring the, the, the budget as you go through the fiscal year. So what, what this really is, is developing a 12-month rolling period with at least one year, ideally probably three years of historical data behind it. And it, it doesn't have to be um, a, a, a template that is overwhelmingly detailed. Um, I, I, you know, I think if you followed along with uh, the, the revenue sources and expenditure functions of, of your audited financial statements, that probably is going to be sufficient information. And in fact, uh, on the expenditure side, that even may be more detailed than you need. You, you probably want the detail to be a little heavier on the revenue side. Typically, expenditures from year to year track rather uniformly. However, revenues don't. Um, they, they can be up and down, and uh, you know that side of the equation brings the most volatility and concern. Um, you know, clearly the the concern relative to to revenue streams is is heightened by COVID-19, um, especially relative to property tax, hotel tax, restaurant tax and other you know, that are coming into local government. Uh, the value of, of monitoring through a cash flow process, you know, cash in the door, cash out the door, is you're going to be able to see a little bit, at least in advance, if you're doing it on a monthly basis, uh, where you may be walking into some problems. Um, if, if your revenue streams are not what they typically were in the height of your revenue stream, um, you're going to you're going to experience some tightness coming out the other side of that, and it will allow you some time to uh, you know address the problem through either alternative short-term financing options, 
or, or by implementing the budget modifications that we previously discussed relative to you know, a long-term plan that, that has some variability to it. GFOA put on um, a, a webinar on, a, on April 24th. It was titled Managing Cash Flow in Crisis. And um, I actually sat through that. It was like an hour. Uh, if, if any of you are interested in this and can track back to that, they had a couple of cash flow models that uh, were available for download. Um, I do have them. I don't, I, I don't think I, I have authority to send them out to anyone. Uh, but they were they were built out tools, and they were, I think one was called simple cash flow uh, modeling, and the other was super simple cash flow modeling templates. Uh, but I, I would assume the GFOA still has access to them and, and can probably provide them. But um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, there are templates out there already, but it, it certainly is a. a um, I think a terrific process to to undertake in order to monitor both your budget activity and unforeseen circumstances coming at us due to COVID-19 and and unfortunately whatever the next crisis may be. So that is going to end my um, my my section here. I'm going to turn this over to Jeff Ziplo to talk about uh, some more uh, virtual information, if you will. And before we hand it off to Jeff, we're going to do uh, the second polling question here. So the poll is launched. Uh, again, we'll give about another 30 to 40 seconds uh, for everyone to, to get their responses in. All right, about another uh, 10 seconds or so here before we close the poll and uh, hand things back over to Jeff. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you, everyone uh, who is uh, participating. All right, I will now hand it. Uh, Jared, we good? We are, Jeff. Okay. So again, this is Jeff Ziplo. Um, I wanted to talk about virtualizing town hall or municipality or your respective municipality. As I mentioned earlier, municipalities really need to rethink how to maintain operations and continue to provide services in this new world. In essence, we just really need to consider and reimagine what that virtual town hall could look like. Um, I think we all know that the concept of a virtual town hall has been around for a while, but now because of COVID, there really is a sense of urgency to implement new um, and better virtual processes. So, and Jared, please go to the next slide. I, I broke down my presentation into a couple of key areas, um, internal, and external processes and operations um, that we need to consider. Um, first one I identified is, you know, the request for a proposal process. Um, I, I bring this up because, it, you know, all municipalities that I've worked with do generate, you know, a, a wide variety of RFPs um, for, for products and services. Um, and they, they typically have a very standard approach and, and methodology. And I would say in most instances, um, you know, we're submitting, uh, vendors are submitting responses, you know, uh, and hard copy responses to the municipality. And in fact, you know, back in the beginning of April during the heat of the COVID crisis, you know, there was actually an RFP that we were responding to. And, um, we were required to submit a hard copy RFP to be delivered. Um, you know, the, the municipality had pretty much closed down, um, but nonetheless, um, the email RFPs were not accepted. They wanted actual signatures on all the various forms and such. And, and I guess my point here is that we need to rethink how we can virtualize the, the whole RFP process while maintaining controls, while validating signatures, um, and even in some instances, if, if a notary is required, how can we 
um, make sure that that actually gets completed. Um, the way to do this is technology. And, and there are a number of technology solutions out there that, that can help with you know, validation of signers and, you know, like a DocuSign, um, the notary type of uh, services, again, through technology. Even if we needed a, a repository where we could put um, any type of RFPs that are submitted. But clearly, we need to be rethinking uh, um, how we could uh, implement this process. And there are many other processes, and I'm only picking on a couple of them today. The purchase order process, you know, is another area that I think we need to rethink from an internal operations perspective. Most municipalities have the ability to create POs electronically. And I've seen a number of municipalities, however, that are not full, fully utilizing their financial software solutions to create that decentralized purchase order or purchase requisition process and make it completely electronic. Um, many municipalities are still relying on the physical movement of paper. So let's rethink this process and utilize the systems better and really force, and you've probably seen this in your respective municipalities, or at least some of them, force all departments to enter their POs or purchase requisitions electronically. Force departments to attach the required departments to the requisition. Again, many of the systems that are out there have these capabilities, we're just not using them or we haven't enforced it. And maybe we could use COVID as a catalyst to eliminate a lot of the workarounds, a lot of the hard copies to the purchase order and requisition process. And maybe we can remove you know, some handwritten voucher processes that currently exist in many municipalities and implement, um, fully implement the electronic workflows and sign-offs um, that we really should be using. And then once the POs have been approved electronically, um, we can electronically send the PO out to the re respective vendor. We don't have to um, mail it to the vendor anymore. We, we can just email it to them. And so these are the types of processes, again, the purchase order processes, implement or uh, impacting um, most, if not all departments. We can do things differently. We just need to rethink them. Moving on to the next slide, you know, check processing. And when I look at check processing, it's for vendors as well as, you know, for payroll checks. And many municipalities today are using a combination of hard copy checks and electronic ACH checks. Um, and, but again, let's use COVID as a catalyst to, to change the way and actually force us to um, do all of this electronically. We, we don't need to be in the office to process checks. And that, that's my mantra. Do we really need to be in the office to do a lot of this work? In our new world, we can consider performing everything electronically. You know, we can think that or no one really has to go to the office and, and process these checks. All checks could be processed remotely, electronically. And yes, the tools do exist. We do need to maintain segregation of duties and responsibilities, but we can actually manage that through electronic workflows and limiting what you know, our employees can perform through the financial management system. So, is check processing doable all, you know, using, you know, systems and, and make it all electronic? The answer is yes. We just need to um, find that catalyst, i.e. COVID, to make it happen for everyone. The last point on this slide is committee meetings. And um, as we all know, we were thrust into um, figuring out how we're going to handle committee meetings, um, board meetings, council meetings. Um, as uh, with the with the COVID crisis, you know, in place. Certainly, you know, there were a number of new new laws enacted by a number of states. I would imagine most that suspended the open meeting laws, um, and this was obviously due as a result of of the COVID crisis. Um, but I think 
now's the time to really rethink what was implemented and equally important, what are the protocols that we should be following? You know, the municipalities were forced to implement a remote solution very quickly. And most, if not all, towns and cities, you know, did so very quickly. Um, a lot of them, you know, uh, used Zoom to make that happen. But we're now at a crossroads. We can now take a step back and rethink how we can use these technologies to implement remote meetings across all areas of the municipality, not just, you know, town council meetings, but maybe all meetings. But in doing so, we need to think about what are those formal protocols that need to be established, and we need to document them. We need to validate and confirm what video conferencing tool, like Zoom or something else, will provide the best capabilities for our respective municipality. Part of that also is going to be identifying who can attend um, or how we can control who attends and actively participate. Um, we need to really think about, you know, and eliminate a person from taking over the video session. I'm sure we've all heard about the Zoom bombing that has occurred um, in, in a number of, of states in a number of meetings. And then we need to think about how and if sessions can be recorded. And all of this is an opportunity to, to take a step back now and really rethink how we, we do things. Um, moving on to the next slide, you know, we are, teleworkers are here um, and, and we are working from home. And, you know, this could be a whole separate topic, but um, that we could spend a lot of time on. But I think part of teleworking is figuring out um, good cyber hygiene for teleworking. We really need to establish and document the policies, procedures, and protocols for working at home. Um, when we're at home, are we using our home PC? And, and the reason I bring that up is I would submit it, it's not a good idea. Um, we may not have the appropriate virus protection software on our home PC. We may have already been infected. Um, our home PCs might not be fully patched with software. So one of the things I strongly recommend is wherever we can, let's rethink how we're purchasing computers. And from this point on, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to understand why we would be purchasing desktop computers. Um, we should really be thinking about um, uh, the laptop computers and being able to allow people to telework from home. Um, we also need to provide more training to our employees so that if they are working from home, um, they have a better understanding and appreciation for, you know, the phishing and spear phishing attacks, what they look like. Um, we, we need to, them to be much more aware of any type of sensitive data um, that they need to be concerned about. Um, so let's move on to the next slide and let's think about some of the external operations. And, and I put here, um, th there's a couple of slides, but just in general, um, you know, the town clerk's office, the permitting process, the tax assessor, parks and rec, these are areas that, you know, we need to be thinking about. I put the town clerk up here as an area that I, I think this may be one of the tougher departments to virtualize, in fact. Um, they use a lot and need and want to track a lot of paper um, and, and hard copy documents. And, and this is an area that I think we're gonna need to start focusing um, our attention on. Some municipalities, particularly in Connecticut and Vermont, have implemented um, some software. One product I think is called Record Hub. Um, that allows us to do things virtually, but we need to create a game plan. We need to create that playbook. We need to figure out how we can take, you know, that town clerk's office and virtualize it. Same thing is true with the permitting process. You know, I had a conversation with a municipality um, actually last Friday. And, and what I learned from them is they actually recently implemented, you know, a fairly new permitting process. So the technology exists. What they didn't do was implement 
the virtualization capabilities. They didn't really implement it, so they had all the permitting forms electronically available. They didn't implement the electronic workflows. And in fact, that's where we need to rethink and redo, if you will, a lot of um, these technologies or implement these technologies differently. You know, as, it, as we move on to the uh, tax collector park and rec areas, um, many of them, I would say these two areas in particular, these two departments have um, relatively good virtualization capabilities in place right now for the most part. And so we can use them as a, um, as a basis for looking forward to the future and using some of their um, uh, skill sets to um, really implement um, virtual operations and really help to bring to our residents um, services and overall operations that they're going to be able to take advantage of. We need to rethink and reimagine how we can perform these services with social distancing and teleworking involved and ultimately create that new virtual town hall. So let me turn it back to Jared. Is, do we have another poll question or, oh, no, we're going to AJ. Yeah, we're going to AJ here. Okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is AJ Morgan I'm with Fiserv, and I have the pleasure of discussing uh, contactless payments and uh, some other uh, helpful ways to accept or disperse payments today. So we can go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, the topics that I'd like to just cover today are uh, around the future of merchant processing. You know, what is the the uh, the go forward with everything, and and what does this look like as far as being helpful with the new normal? Um, so a few of the things I like to cover are contactless payments and you know, what forms are available and how do we use them? What are the benefits? Um, I'd like to discuss curbing your costs of card acceptance um, and, and online payments with convenience fees. Um, how do we reduce our costs or reduce expenses from the budget? Uh, how do we expand uh, forms of payment acceptance? And how do we get uh, online fast and uh, receive online payments where you currently are not? And then the last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, prepaid card distribution or how we can distribute funds uh, to those who need it uh, quickly. All right, so contactless payments. So what are contactless payments? And I'm sure that most of you have been um, in, you know, in use with this in some form or another, whether you're currently accepting them or you're a user um, or you've just even heard of it. But uh, essentially what this is, is a combination of a few things. Number one, mobile wallets. So mobile wallets are inclusive of your Apple Pay, your Google Pay, your Samsung Pay, um, even, you know, online forms of payment uh, or, or mobile wallet payments like uh, PayPal, um, you know, P2P PayPal or P2P Venmo, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also NFC and RFID or near field communication and radio frequency ID cards. Uh, and those are actual physical cards that you can use uh, at a terminal and just tap, uh, similar to using Apple Pay or something like that. Um, and essentially, if your card has that capability, you'll see a little sideways looking Wi-Fi signal on it, like you see on the slide there on the right. And you can use those to just tap. And that's very similar to uh, the way you might have experienced using a hotel key card that you didn't insert or swipe. You just held it up near the door and it opened or unlocked for you. And then uh, another form is stored value cards. So uh, you may have uh, come in contact with this in, uh, you know, a public transit or a parking card or something like that, where uh, you have a card that is uh, sometimes not even really a hard plastic. Sometimes it's a, a kind of paper, a thicker paper card, um, but it has some stored value on it. So it's got, you know, either rides available or it's got money available on it. Um, and essentially you use those uh, to uh, hold up to a, a scanning device uh, or they're disposable. So once you've used them, then they're done, but they hold value on them for the user. Um, so how do we use these things and why are they important? So obviously uh, you, you probably know that you can use mobile wallets and these uh, near field cards, uh, you know, in an office. So if you're accepting payments, you know, at a, at a window or a counter, um, you're taking payments or somebody's uh, making purchases at a counter, 
uh, you can actually accept these uh, contactless payments. And uh, it's sort of a, a, a quicker way of taking a payment, but it's also more convenient in the way that it's completely you know, touchless. So you're adhering to some of those social distancing methodologies. Um, and also you have uh, touchless transit uh, cards too. So you have a, a, a little bit safer of a way of conducting business um, with transit authorities, as well as uh, in parking lots, et cetera. Um, obviously your, your biggest benefit is that, you know, adhering to the social distancing uh, methodologies as well as expanding the options for consumers uh, in the way that you accept payments. So instead of forcing somebody to pay cash check, uh, we're expanding that out to not just, you know, credit and debit cards, but also these virtual cards um, that they carry around with them in their wallets or on their phone. Uh, and they're, it's just really expanding the, the way that you can uh, interact and, and accept payment with your consumers. So we'll go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about um, curbing costs with convenience fees and, and what does that mean? So a convenience fee is essentially a charge that is passed from the municipality to the consumer as a fee that is, you know, charged in, for the convenience of you accepting their card um, instead of cash or check. And the best part about this is it basically creates a zero cost uh, to the municipality to process those debit cards or those credit cards. Um, this can be done whether you're taking them physically uh, or you could be done online. So uh, this is a very, very uh, effective manner to reduce some of those costs uh, when you're taking them, you know, at a terminal and the cost of the terminal or reducing the online payments when it costs money for a gateway or your uh, hosting uh, payment pages or something like that. And it's going to basically just uh, pass that fee or that cost on to the consumer um, in a very small or minor fee to them and it is a convenience to them. And they typically uh, appreciate that option. Um, you're basically taking, uh, you know, these payments without sacrificing the option of taking cash and check is just expanding the availability for your way of taking payments. And this is the quickest way to get yourself up and running uh, online without incurring any extra expense. So when you are discussing with a merchant provider, um, the option of convenience fees, you're taking into consideration the fact that that fee is covering all of the expenses necessary to get you up and running online and to have yourself a, a payment page that's hosted. So if you're currently only taking payments, say in an office or over the phone, you can actually uh, push that payment methodology to an online environment um, without it costing you much at all. And typically uh, that can be up and running faster than uh, even an in-person online or in-person physical terminal payment uh, device. So um, this pro also promotes, you know, by being online, it promotes the social distancing it's also uh, well adopted by citizens, especially if you're not um, providing any existing online payment options. They're typically interested in uh, paying small fee in order for the convenience to be able to make those payments online instead and, and from the convenience of their homes, particularly now. All right, and lastly, uh, the other thing that is uh, to consider is how you are distributing funds if needed. So. If you need to get money out to people or groups, um, say you are uh, distributing uh, payments uh, to, to various uh, applicants, or you're needing to distribute payments to some groups or a vendor, or you're even needing to get payments out to employees, um, one of the best ways to do that, or the quickest way to do that, is by the issuance of a branded reloadable prepaid card. Um, essentially, you can get uh, prepaid cards physically out as well as digitally out. So within certain uh, disbursements, you can you can receive them via an application. Uh, so again, this is you know abiding the contactless environment as well as uh, having an immediate um, accessibility to those funds. The funds are almost uh, in, in all cases available immediately upon reception and they're you know available immediately if you're reloading them. So uh, these can be typically distributed by uh, the manufacturer or at will by the municipality. And once they're arriving in the hands of the user, they're available immediately. And they're one of the most safe and secure ways to distribute funds. So 
with that in mind, hopefully you keep these things uh, about you when you're evaluating your current um, payment acceptance and or looking to make uh, disbursements. And I will hand it back to you, Jared. Great, thank you, AJ. Uh, we've got our last poll question here that I will launch. Um, so again, we'll, we'll keep this poll question up for about 45 seconds about. Uh, and again, if you are here for CPE credit, uh, you will need to uh, to answer uh, all of the polling questions. And this is the final one here. Going to give it about another 10 seconds here for, for those uh, who still haven't gotten their responses in. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, uh, for participating. And uh, I will now hand it off to Lori. Thank you, Jared. And um, good morning, everyone. So my name is Lori Aguila. I'm with Alon, and we are partnered with Webster Bank to provide our purchasing card solution, the One Card. So during my time today, I'm going to cover how purchasing cards can be beneficial in today's new environment for both um, T&E, travel and entertainment type payments, as well as paying your vendors. So on our first slide here, uh, are talking, um, we're going to be talking through utilizing physical plastic cards for things like T&E, office supplies, et cetera, um, and how it can be beneficial to your operations. First, I'll cover a few of the benefits and then elaborate on some of them as well. So the first one here being enhanced transaction data capture on those purchases, and then the second one being efficiencies gained with expense management um, capabilities. So with purchasing card programs, you're um, given a card management platform that allows for you to not only be self-serve on your program, but it also gives you the ability to obtain detailed transaction data, um, such as GL codes, department centers, cost centers, and you can organize the reporting however you want, by the codes, by the merchant, by the cardholder, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways you can really get that data out of the system. Within the card platform, you also have, have the ability to do things like changing limits, which is real time. You can order cards, you can terminate cards, you can put cards on hold, which is also real time. And in addition, you have the ability to control where the card can actually be used based on the type of merchant. So this is especially important in today's environment if you're wanting to keep a closer eye on spending and really control where those cards um, are used or um, how large their purchases are, things like that. So circling back to the second benefit listed, expense management functionality. So this functionality gives you the ability to code transactions within the card platform. You can then pull reports um, from the system and upload back into your accounting system to assist with that reconciliation process. Um, the other option is that reporting can potentially be um, automatically sent back to your system if your system has the ability to accept Visa's file format. So there's multiple ways that that could be done. But for the expense management, um, your process is that your cardholders would log into the system, code their transactions, for example, that GL, the cost center, department, whatever you're using for your allocations, um, and then the cardholder can also upload receipts, they can add comments, and then once that's complete, they send the transactions for approval, typically to a manager. The manager can then either approve or send back to the employee uh, if, if any changes need to be made. So that's just an example of a hierarchy, but that could be set up um, however you would want. So really the end goal is that all transactions um, are coded and reviewed before they're sent up to that program administrator who can then pull that um, full report from our system. So finally, the last, mention, the last item to mention here on the slide is really just to, to let you know that purchasing cards are a corporate liability and personal guarantees uh, are not required with this card. And then moving on to our second slide. So this is talking through vendor payments. Um, first, we're gonna cover the benefits themselves. And then when we go on to our third slide, I'll review the different ways that you can actually pay your vendors. So, 
some of the benefits in today's environment, extension of uh, working capital resulting in more cash in hand. So purchasing card programs give you the ability to float your cash. As an example, a program can be set up with a 30-day cycle and then you have 14 days to pay that balance in full. So this essentially gives you up to 44 days of float depending on when that payment was made. When you write a check, as you probably know, it's um, deposited fairly quickly and then the funds are deducted. But if you put uh, the purchases onto the card program, then you get that extra float time before you have to pay that balance. The second item here, offering the ability to digitize and automate payment processes, um, resulting in boosting your efficiencies. So um, this ties a little bit back to what was discussed in um, the virtual processes section, um, how we can help out in just making the, your, the process more virtual. So there's functionality within purchasing card programs called e-payables, electronic payables, which essentially allows for you to make credit card payments to your vendors through your account system. So when we go on to the third slide, I'll talk about that process in more detail. But um, just at a high level, your process is very similar to um, a check run. And then all of that detailed reporting we spoke about earlier is captured and you can upload that back into your accounting system. And then our third item here, um, reducing not only the cost and fraud associated with checks, but also minimizing the need to have check writing or to have people going into the office uh, to, to mail those checks out. So fewer checks mean um, decreased printing, postage, labor, and all of those costs can really add up. Um, in addition, paying vendors on a card program will also reduce, again, as I mentioned, the need for somebody to be in the office to mail those checks. So that gives you greater flexibility. Um, but in addition to the savings part of it there, um, there's also increased rebate potential on purchasing card programs because the more that you put onto the card program, the higher that your uh, cashback rebate is going to be. And then moving on to uh, our third and final slide here. So as far as options go for uh, paying your vendors, there's three main ways you can do that. Option one, the first one here, physical plastic cards. So um, this type of uh, process would be exactly the same as it would be as having any other um, physical plastic card that an employee would, would have. So you would just order another card or however many cards that you wanted to be specifically used for paying your vendors. And with this option, you also have the ability to emboss whatever you want on the card. So some organizations will emboss um, accounting department or vendor purchases. Again, it's, you know, whatever your preference is there. The second option, self-created single-use credit card accounts. So um, with this option, you log into your card platform and you create these single-use accounts, which means that they are accounts that expire after the vendor charges against them. And what's nice about this option is um, when you go into the system, you can individually send them to your vendors as needed or you can actually have it sent to yourself using your email address, and then you can either provide that to their vendors or even to your um, employees. Some organizations, uh, if, if an employee doesn't have a card and they maybe need a card number just for one very specific purpose, they'll go through this exact process, get the card information, and then just give it to that employee. And again, once they use it, it expires. Um, so definitely a lot of um, security around that option, which is nice. And then finally, um, the ePayable solution integrated back into your AP system. So this I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, but it's very similar to a check run. So you choose the files that need to be sent via credit card. We send a payment instruction file over to your vendor, and then they receive an email with all of the payment information that you included, purchase order number, date, dollar amount, all of those details. And then they also receive a link to our secure site where they'll go to get the card number, expiration, all of those details. And then once they process that payment, all of the detailed remittance data will populate back into the card system, so you're able to get that really detailed reporting back into your AP system. Um, so in summary, and looking at a P-card program as a whole, again, including um, travel and entertainment and vendor payments, um, I would say the biggest benefits in, um, to your operations in today's environment would be the enhanced transaction data for greater visibility into your spending, efficiencies that you gain with the card management platform, and then as we just spoke about, um, automating your, your vendor payments and all of the benefits that come along with that. So um, thank you so much for your time, and um, with that, Jared, I'll pass it back over to you. 
Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laurie, for that. I, I know we're just at about our, our time here, um, and we did get a couple of questions. Um, so we'll try to get to, to one or two of these here, and then uh, we, we can follow up uh, with people who submitted questions individually. Uh, Steve, I, I think this first one uh, would go to you. And uh, talking about some of the, the economic factors, um, should people be concerned about new total federal debt uh, not, not to mention the fiscal deficit as well. Uh, obviously, it's 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 a, a staggering number, and um, for, for now, one of the, one of the things we're going to keep an eye on is long term rates. I mean, obviously, the, the long end of the curve has moved up slightly, but it doesn't seem to be overly concerned about it. But one thing that's working in the government's favor in this situation is where interest rates are right now. Uh, back in 1980s, when you know we had a lot of spending, when uh, uh, President Reagan was building up the military, our percentage, our, our interest expense as a percentage of GDP was up just north of five percent. Right now. The, the number of dollars amount outstanding is much higher than it was in 1985, but from a percentage standpoint, we're just under 3%. And, and that's a factor that, you know, we've got much lower rates today than we did back then. So uh, the market is telling us that um, when you look around the global picture, um, whether you can say the U.S. is the best or the least worst, um, the, the global economy seems to think that we're going to be able to pay our bills, even though we're running up our credit card right now. So um, at some point, the Fed's going to have to do a tightrope dance and try and reel in some of this liquidity that they pumped in so generously um, as the economy starts to come back and, and try to do that without choking off the recovery. But for now, um, even though the numbers are staggering, uh, the credit markets aren't concerned. Great, thanks, Steve. And I know we're, we're over time here, but we'll get to, to one more here. And, and Ron, I think you could take this one. Uh, about It's a question about the use of, of fund balance with, with some towns having dipped into that. Are you able to discuss some best practices around that and, and what you're seeing this year? Um, well, we haven't seen a whole lot, uh, obviously, to, to date right now relative to having to access fund balance or deplete fund balance for um, the purposes of, of you know, making the current budget year work uh, relative to a budget that went in as a balanced budget. Now, the, the, you know, the, the, the guidelines that um, GFOA uh, proposes or, or indicates would be you should be carrying a fund balance of around seven and a half to I think it's uh, 16% now. And, um, you know, I think that to be brutally honest, that uh, if that's a policy, that's a policy that you have um, or whatever your policy may be, I think it's going to be challenged by this crisis uh, moving forward. And, and we may see a tick up uh, relative to the guidance that they're providing, but you know, insofar as when to access, uh, that that really, um, you know, you, you got to look at fact and circumstances relative to that community, uh, you know, with, with all that's going on. Is it merely just an, an issue uh, with the general fund or are there um, other other items that, that are going to need support? And then also, what what are you uh, relinquishing if you're going to have to access those funds if you're down the lower end of of, of that policy spectrum? So, great, Ron. Uh, th thank you for that answer there, and, and thank you to uh, everyone who attended today's webinar. Uh, we will be emailing out a recording of the webinar along with the slides uh, to everyone here. And again, if you are attending this webinar for CPE credit, in that email will also be a link to an evaluation to complete on the webinar. And that's the uh, final piece you will need to, to get your credit. So uh, thank you everyone for attending uh, and uh, stay safe everyone. Thank you.